Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. It can be found in the Pew Bible on page 949. We'll be reading verses 1 to 7. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Romans 15, 1 to 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This is God's word. Let us pray. For the glory of God. Our Lord, we ask that everything that takes place over the next few moments as we hear from you, from your word, would be to the glory of God. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored and exalted and treasured in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you are not a figment of our imagination but you are real. Indeed, you are here by your Spirit, present. And you are not a silent God like the idols, but a speaking God. These truths are too high for us and too awesome, and yet they are true. And so we ask now, Lord, that this would be to the glory of God, to your glory, and thereby thrill us with your beauty and love. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, turn with me to your Bibles, Romans chapter 15 and verses 1 to 7. This may not seem to you to be the most natural Advent text. Reminds me of a Gary Larson cartoon. Gary Larson has a cartoon of uh, the wise men going to visit the infant baby. Except there are not three wise men, as it is traditionally thought to have been, but in this cartoon there are four. And underneath uh, Gary Larson's cartoon, he has the line which says, Most biblical scholars do not realize, but actually there were four wise men at the uh, nativity scene, but the fourth wise man was turned away for bringing fruitcake. (laughs) Well, this is not a fruitcake of an Advent text. In fact, though it is, of course, the next in our series uh, on uh, this book of Romans, it is deeply connected to Advent themes, for the title is the example of Christ. And indeed, that is the theme of uh, this passage. Accept one another then, or welcome one another then, just as Christ welcomed you in order to bring glory or praise to God. 
And then uh, right at the heart of the passage, uh, verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. And we'll find that throughout the passage, Paul is bringing in the example of Christ. Now, perhaps for some of us even here this morning, and certainly in our culture, Jesus does seem a bit of a figment of imagination. I want to bring to you two quotations from people who are not Christians about Jesus as we think of the example of Christ. This one is from H.G. Wells. I am a historian, he wrote, I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. And he goes on in similar vein. Or Jewish author Shalom Ash said this, Jesus Christ, interesting he uses the word Christ or Messiah, Jesus Christ is to me the outstanding personality of all time, all history, both as son of God and as son of man. Everything he ever said or did has value for us today, and that is something you can say of no other man, dead or alive. Well, we don't need such testimony if uh, we are Christians, for we read the Bible and we experience Christ by his Spirit, and we know that he is the most important person that ever was, and indeed is the Lord of all glory. But it is helpful to realize that even someone who, like H.G. Wells, uh, confessed that he was not a believer, realized that the example of Christ is the very center of all history. We must not make a division between the Apostle Paul and Jesus. Paul is a preacher of Christ. He preaches Jesus. And when he comes now to the close of this section about accepting or welcoming each other, he brings in Christ, not as an afterthought, but as the final and conclusive argument that uh, we should follow his teaching. So verse 7, I've already quoted as the end of the section, and I think it is the end of the section because chapter 14, verse 1, begins uh, with similar wording. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, welcome him or accept him whose faith is weak. And then chapter 15, verse 1, we are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. And then the end of the section, chapter 15, verse 7, welcome one another then just as Christ welcomed you. So this whole section has been about how the strong, that is those who are making an application of their faith in a more open-handed way to the secondary issues of the church at Rome, should not despise the weak, that is those who are making a more picky or narrow application of their faith to the secondary issues of the Church of Rome, in particular Judaistic food and ritual laws and ceremonial days and the rest. And Paul has been saying, no, you should not judge or despise each other on those secondary matters. And as we saw last week, he said, keep the main thing the main thing. That was my summary of what he was saying anyway. Or as College Church has said down through its many years, in essentials unity, in non-essentials diversity, in all things charity. In other words, we here do not all need to agree about baptism. We here do not all need to agree about our eschatology. We here do not all need to agree about uh, the color of the carpet. We here do not all need to agree about this or that matter that you can read about on the internet that is much discussed in many different blogs and often brought forward with great passion and significance. But our passion is to be Christ. And if you are Christ, then you're one of us. We're for you and you are welcome. Paul wants the Church of Rome not to get distracted on the secondary issues but to focus on the main thing, for the main thing is the mainly important thing. That is the proclamation of the gospel, the extension of the kingdom of God for which the church of God is a tool. And if we get distracted on these secondary matters, we will not be able to use all the energy that God gives us for the main thing. And so we must keep focusing on the main thing. 
Now that's what he's been saying. So he comes to conclude he wants them to guard against a couple of dangers. So look down with me as uh, we see how he concludes in verse 1. So he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So to begin with, he's saying we must bear with the failings of the weak. Well, the image here is of carrying, lifting, bearing. It is, of course, the image that comes from the cross carrying or bearing or taking our sins that Jesus did there. And he refers to it again in verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. He bore our sins and our weaknesses, our failings, even the insults that we have experienced. He bore our sins on the cross. And now Paul says, we who are strong must bear with the failings of the weak. Now that does not mean that we give up trying to disciple or encourage or shape or form someone who needs to grow in their understanding about various matters in the Christian faith. As he'll say in a moment, we must uh, please our neighbor in order to build them up. We're aiming to grow and develop as Christians here. It does not mean that we think that uh, the weak in their attitude and in their faith have the right answer. For as Paul said last week, as we saw, no, actually they are wrong in their attitude. They do not have the right answer about this secondary issue of food and ritual and ceremonial days. They do need to grow in their understanding about it. But it must mean that we are to bear with the failings of the weak. That is, that we are to carry those failings and have an attitude of welcome and acceptance. Makes all the difference, doesn't it? If you sense that you are welcomed, whatever race. Of course, there's a racial issue here behind this. You had Jews and Gentiles in the same church. Whatever race, whatever culture, whatever class, Uh, Those of us who are upper class can be snobbish to those of us who are lower class. Of course, it can work the other way. There can be an inverse snobbery where we judge those who we view as more powerful than ourselves and they despise us. Paul says the church is not to have any of that. We welcome each other. And even if we discern that that particular person is wrong in a certain area of the secondary set of issues, that is not the gospel, not the core moral discipleship of Christ, but the secondary issues of church life and even the tertiary issues of ministry philosophy, when we think actually they're wrong about such things and maybe they need to grow in such areas and indeed maybe we need to instruct them at some point so that they can grow. We want them to be built up and grow in their faith. Nonetheless, we come with a different attitude. We come with the attitude of bearing with those failings. As the Bible says elsewhere, love covers over a multitude of sins. And that means for you, When you come in this door and perhaps you feel like, am I really welcome at College Church? I'm not sure whether I fit or not. You are welcome because Christ has welcomed you. And that is true for any race, any culture. For the central ground on which we stand is not culture, it is not class, it is not any of those secondary issues that divide people all over the world and indeed in this country. They do not divide us. We stand at the foot of the cross, and all nations are welcome here, and all cultures are welcome here, and all classes are welcome here, and we do not make divisions over food, which is so often a cultural or class or race issue, special ceremonies or days, again, so often a class or racial or cultural issue. No, the one Lord of all is Jesus Christ, and on that basis, We are all welcome. 
It's very, very important that we get that straight. At the heart, the primary issue is the gospel, discipleship. Now, of course, in our culture today, people put other things at the center. They do not put Christ and discipleship. What they put at the center is there is no truth. And indeed, any moral behavior is acceptable. And what they were saying is the only way you can have a community or unity is by saying there is no truth and all behavior is acceptable, particularly sexual um, um, immorality of various kinds. We need to remove all those barriers in order to have community. But the great irony of it, as, as that doctrine has been proclaimed to this country for the last 50 years, we are more divided than ever. Is that not true? And when the gospel of Jesus Christ took prominence, we were united. Why? Because Christ is Lord and relativism is divisive. The reason why it's divisive is if you do not hold to that doctrine, then you are not welcome. It is deeply exclusionary. It excludes so many people. But in Christ, all races, all cultures, all classes are welcome. And that means as a community we need to reflect that and bear with the failings of the weak. But then uh, the second half of verse 1 and verse 2, we are to have an attitude not to please ourselves. For each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. Well, this is very difficult, isn't it? Um, Someone will say, I thought I was meant to please God, not please my neighbor. But now you're saying I should please people. I'm confused now, Paul. Am I meant to glorify God or am I meant to please people? Should I be a people pleaser? Well, here, I think, is the way to understand what Paul is saying. If we are to choose between, between pleasing God or pleasing our neighbor, we must choose to please God. And there'll be times when that is difficult. Uh, Many people today want us to please them by saying that Jesus is not the only way to God. But we must please God, not our neighbor. So if we are to choose between pleasing God or pleasing our neighbor, we must choose to please God. We follow what the Bible says, not what our neighbors wish that the Bible said. If we are to choose between pleasing God or pleasing our neighbor, that is the choice. Of course, we must choose to please God. But that's not the realm in which Paul's teaching here. The realm in which Paul's teaching here is a different choice. It is the choice between pleasing ourselves or pleasing our neighbor. And so often that is the real choice, isn't it? The secondary issues are so often matters of preference, or if we're really frank with each other, matters of what pleases us. And so that phrase in non-essentials diversity, in all things charity, we aim to please our neighbor. We prefer each other. It's not our preference. Our preference, well, it's not a preference. It's an obligation, as Paul said. Our obligation is to please each other, not please ourselves. There's a wonderful little joke about this that I like to tell. It's often told in England, but not in America, so I can tell it here as much as I like, and you think it's great, which is good. The question is this, what is the slowest thing on four legs, right? You got that picture clear to your mind? What is the slowest thing on four legs? And the answer is two Christians trying to get through a door. After you, no, after you, no, after you, no, after you, no, after you. (laughs) It's pretty silly, isn't it?
but then it should be true. When we're in a committee meeting, or in a small group, when it is not a matter of biblical doctrine and Christian morality, when it is a secondary issue, our attitude should be after you, to please our neighbor. Well, says Paul, actually, this is what Jesus did, verse 3. For this, as we have seen, is characteristic of what Christ did. So verse 3, for even Christ did not please himself. You see, obviously, Jesus pleased God, but he didn't please himself in a selfish way. As it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now, this is a very profound um, reference here, and if you have a Bible open, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 69. It comes from Psalm 69 and uh, verse 9. As you turn up that text, I want to quote to you from G.K. Chesterton about this matter here, which really does connect the whole sermon to Advent and the Incarnation and Christmas themes. G.K. Chesterton said this, G.K. Chesterton, Christianity is the only religion on earth that has felt that omnipotence made God incomplete. What a profound statement. God became man. In other words, there's a part of God in Christ that is revealed in Christ which is not self-serving but other-serving. And the quotation comes from Psalm 69, and particularly verse 9, Paul, uh, David is saying, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck, verse 1. He's in a real trouble, he's in difficulty, I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold, perhaps you feel like that this morning. You're not sure where salvation is going to come from. You, you feel that there, verse 4, those who hate you without reason. There are people out to get you. You feel alienated from your friends, perhaps. But why was David feeling this? Well, verse 9. For zeal for your house consumes me. And the insults of those who insult you fall on me. In other words, David was a church man. He put his body in the way of those who are attacking the house of God and the insults of those who insult you fell on David in some small way, ultimately fulfilled in Christ who gave his blood for the church. So back to Romans 15, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. In other words, when we ask ourselves the question, what would Jesus do? Right at the heart of that question must have reference to the local church. Jesus took the insults that had fallen on his people. Now, why does Paul bring all this in, all this biblical theology that we could spend a long time unpicking and discussing, why does he bring it all in when he's focusing on this matter of how we are to welcome each other? Well, the obvious answer is because we are to focus on Christ. There's so many issues out there today that we could talk about, and at some level we should talk about and have seminars on and even sermons on. There is a place for discussing the controversial issues of our day, of course. But there must be a primary place for focusing on Christ. That's what Paul was trying to get them to do. The way to get people to accept each other of any culture, any class, any race is to think about Christ. 
And then we remember he did not please himself. And then we have a point of unity. A church or a ministry that is disunited is always a church or a ministry that has forgotten its primary vision. As Paul says elsewhere, if I resolve to know nothing when I was with you, but Christ and him crucified. So how do we have this welcome? Well, we focus on Christ. And of course, then Christmas is a wonderful, wonderful reminder of all that. His humility. Indeed, his humanity. And most of all, of course, his death on the cross when he took our sins and the insults that God's people had and indeed still do experience. When we think of what went on in uh, Egypt uh, this week uh, to the Coptic church there, when we think of all the sufferings of God's people that Christ himself has carried, how can we not welcome someone of a different culture, a different race, and a different class? It is simply impossible. So we focus on Christ. But then also, uh, verse 4, we focus on Scripture. So he says, verse 4, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Or perhaps that's what you most need this morning, hope. Perhaps you've come in this morning saying, I'm really in despair. I'm on the point of giving up. If I could give you one remedy for that feeling, it would be this. The Bible. Before you leave this morning, would you make a fresh commitment to read the Bible? If you are lacking hope, if you're not sure where the courage is going to come from for the next task on your agenda or on your to-do list, the number one remedy is simply the following. Read the Bible. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The endurance, the courage of the Scriptures that we might have hope. Well, but Paul is a teacher and he cannot resist the opportunity to trace out, even in very brief form, a basic biblical theology of how the Old Testament connects the New Testament. So verse 3, number 1, it connects by pointing us to Christ, but then number 2, there's also moral instruction in the Old Testament. For everything that was written, the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Well, again, why is he bringing in the Scriptures now and all their work and ministry among us as he talks about welcome each other? And of course, the answer is we should not only focus on Christ, we should focus on Scripture. We must be a Bible-teaching church. When small groups start to uh, get friction, they've often stopped studying the Bible. We need courage to love each other, strength, power, and all that comes from the food of God's Word. So we focus on Christ, we focus on Scripture, we study the Bible together to give us courage and strength and hope. And then, uh, of course, we focus on God himself, verses 5 and 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last week or so. I'm preaching next Sunday on the book of Isaiah or as uh, you people like to say, Isaiah. And in particular, Isaiah chapter 9, and I won't preach that whole sermon for you, but I want to give you a sense of what Paul is saying here that is illustrated by Isaiah chapter 9. 
In the book of Isaiah, the prophet is saying, do not trust in political alliances, do not trust in this or that other thing, do not fear, trust in God. And here similarly, Paul is calling us to focus on God himself, God who gives encouragement, who gives endurance. In other words, God is not simply an idea. He is not simply a worldview. If I, if I may put it like this, God does things. So we don't read the scriptures to get encouragement and endurance. So you notice that it's the same pair of words that Paul uses there from the scriptures and now from God himself. We don't read the scriptures to get encouragement and endurance purely as an intellectual thing, but because God himself utilizes them, speaks through them, and we encounter him and he gives endurance. So when we come to church together, we're not simply going through the motions. It's a real danger, isn't it, that we, we just become sort of mechanical. We are actually coming together to encounter the living God. And that God himself will give us courage. And so Paul says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement strengthen you. so that you have the power that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he brings it all back together, focusing on God, on Christ, through the scriptures. So we bear with each other's failings. That's how we welcome as Christ bore our failings. We aim to please not ourselves but each other, building each other up, not aiming for our preferences after you after you. We focus on Christ crucified, that's how we do it. We focus on the Bible, that's how we do it. We focus on God himself as the living and true God. And so this way, verse seven, we welcome each other as Christ has accepted and welcomed us. So welcome is not simply a handshake, it is inclusion, be a part of the body of Christ. And through this means we glorify God, which is the prayer I began with uh, this morning for a reason. That is, it is so easy for us to think that this subject, this theme of welcome is sort of sentimental, minor, not significant, sort of baby stuff. And what Paul is saying is actually this glorifies God. What is more, he has said this is not an optional extra for the Christian. This, he has said, is an obligation. We who are strong, verse 1, ought to bear with the feelings of the weak. We must. If the point of our unity is in Christ, if that is the primary thing, then we must, we have an obligation to bear with the failings of those who are in Christ, for that is the primary thing. This is an obligation. It's a very important word, I think, that for Paul in Romans. If you come back with me very briefly as we conclude now to Romans chapter 1, verse 14, you'll see how he began using that word. He says there, I am bound, or same word, obliged, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to Greeks and Jews, Jews and Gentiles, all nations, both to the wise and the foolish. You sometimes wonder whether for Paul, being bound to the foolish was almost more difficult than being bound to the Greeks. I don't know. He was such an intellectual, wasn't he? I am bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are Rome. So there's an obligation there, he feels, to preach the gospel to all nations. Then you come to me, with me to chapter 8 and verse 12. Here is another obligation. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. That is something we must do. But it is not the sinful nature to live according to it. No, it is to live according to the work of the Spirit and to become increasingly like Christ. So grace is not cheap grace. We must grow in our holiness and discipleship. It is an obligation. And then you see the same word in chapter 13. This time used about our relationship to secular society. Chapter 17, uh, 13, verse 7, give everyone what you owe him. or what, it, it, There's an obligation here. And then verse 8, eight let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing obligation to love one another. And now he comes to uh, 15, verse 1. We have an obligation or we ought or we must bear with the failings of the weak. This is not an optional extra. We have been welcomed by Christ, therefore we must welcome each other. It is an obligation. Of course, that word obligation or debt is difficult. It could so easily become a new sort of legalism. We are saved by grace. And yet, says Paul, because of that grace, there is a grace wrought obligation. In any case you think I'm being novel or strange or different, let me quote to you two old hymns that make a similar point. One well known, one not well known. First, a debtor to mercy alone. That's what Paul's talking about here, obligation. A debtor to mercy alone. My name from the palm of your hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on your heart, it remains in marks of indelible grace. A debtor to mercy or a debtor to grace? Yes, I to the end will endure until I bow down at your throne forever and always secure a debtor to mercy alone. And then less well known from John Newton. I'll just quote a couple of lines for the sake of time, but they are the most important ones of it. A less well known John Newton hymn, he says this, what think you of Christ? See the example of Christ? What think you of Christ? That is the test to try both your state and your scheme. That is uh, both who you are and how you act. You cannot be right in the rest. That is, you cannot get everything right in your life. You cannot be right in the rest unless you think rightly of him. Or as Paul says, welcome each other as Christ has welcomed you. Let us pray. First, let us uh, bow before God in worship and ask him to give us endurance, that is, the ability not to give up, and ask him to give us courage, encouragement, that is, the boldness to live as Christians today, encouragement and endurance. Let us ask God to do that for us now. And then with that strength, 
let us ask God. As we are debtors to mercy alone, to follow the example of Christ.